Uh, I was watching things in Helsinki and was pleased that we have more people here than at the press conference in Helsinki right now. So we'll see if we can make some news. Like the Hoagie Carmichael Stuart Gorell song from the 1930s, made famous by Ray Charles, I've had Georgia on my mind for this event for a couple of years, and it's really good to be in Atlanta, and we welcome all of you uh, here today. We're excited to bring this signature event, one of our signature events, to Atlanta. And I know that our 14 coaches, the 42 student athletes who you'll meet this week, are also pleased to be here and grateful for your presence. Today's kickoff event was once known as the Skywriters Tour. In fact, we have a photo from 1966. I'm not sure any of you are in this photo. This is how Media Days began. And from 1966 until 1983, our media activity in the summer was the Skywriters Tour. Mark Womack had been on the SEC staff for 27 years the moment this photo was taken. Since 1985, every SEC Media Day event has been in Birmingham, Alabama, and this is the first to be in Atlanta. We started yesterday with what we called SEC Summerfest in Centennial Park. Grateful to bring some fans into that experience, have the Monday Night Football crew, which includes now SEC Nation alum Joe Tessitore, LSU alum Booger McFarlane, and former Tennessee Vol Jason Witten in that broadcast booth. It's also great to be in the College Football Hall of Fame. This setting provides us with a unique opportunity to experience some memories in a venue that's focused on college football. There are 107 individuals, former student athletes or former coaches associated with the SEC who are honored in this hall. And it's our hope that some of the young men you meet here today will one day return and be honored here for their achievements. Being in Atlanta reminds us of this city's important place in the history of the Southeastern Conference. It was in Atlanta on February 27, 1933 on West Peachtree Street at the old Biltmore Hotel, where then University of Kentucky President Frank L. McVeigh brought to order the first ever meeting of the Southeastern Conference, the first annual meeting that we now know is in Destin. The Georgia Dome provided us a home for 23 consecutive national championship games, and with our move to Mercedes-Benz Stadium last year, we experienced the second highest attended SEC championship game ever. The most highly attended SEC championship game was that first one in 1992 in Birmingham, and we've come close. We haven't eclipsed that mark, but we've got a new second place finisher. It's in January, we also witnessed an all-SEC college football playoff national championship game. Obviously the first time that in the college football playoff format, two teams from the same conference have competed for the national title. It's the second time, however, since 2011, that two SEC teams have been in the national championship game. And in that game, between Alabama and Georgia, there were 38 student athletes displaying one of the SEC graduate patches. In fact, of those 38 young men who had already received their bachelor's degree, three at the time of kickoff had already completed their master's degree. During the 2017-18 year, over 350 of our student athletes wore an SEC graduate patch and then competed wearing that patch on their uniform. These achievements in our collective history are always important to remember. That's why last year, we honored the SEC's pioneers of integration by presenting them with the Michael L. Slive Distinguished Service Award. On an evening in early December, we gathered just a few blocks from here where we learned that we had lost one of those pioneers, Vanderbilt's Perry Wallace, who passed away that day. We learned of this loss as we were inviting the group onto the stage where later they were joined for a photo with the SEC's seventh commissioner, Mike Slive. In that moment, none of us would have imagined that today Mike would not be at his home in front of his television watching these remarks on the SEC network. Two years ago, for me personally, before the 2016 version of SEC Media Days, Mike and I visited at our satellite's Starbucks office. As we left, standing outside, Mike grabbed my arm and said to me, he said this, it's your conference now. 
You don't need to talk about me. You're the commissioner, and it's your conference. I'm going to violate Mike's rule this morning. Talk about him for just a moment. Whether he knew it or not, that morning after coffee, he gave me a great gift of encouragement and of confidence. In this room, many of you had your own experiences with Mike Slive. We could probably pass a microphone around and you could share a story that would take us all the way through Thursday. This past Saturday was the date of the 50th wedding anniversary for Mike and Liz Slive. We miss Mike, but we know that the loss is even greater for his family. We remain grateful for his contribution and grateful to Liz, to Anna, to Judd, and to Abigail for sharing Mike with us all. Losses like these serve as reminders, reminders of friendships, reminders of moments, reminders of achievement, reminders of the tough times and of the great times. And in the Southeastern Conference, we've had some heartbreaking losses in the last year, but have also realized stories of remarkable success. SEC teams captured five national championships. Though not an SEC-sponsored sport, we also congratulate Kentucky's rifle team and Vanderbilt's women's bowling team, for they captured national championships as well. We had 11 of our teams finish runner-up in national championship contests. We're not looking for second place, but still, I think we had 14 of our 21 sports finish in either first or second nationally. Another year of an SEC women's basketball team playing in the Final Four national championship game. Eight SEC men's basketball teams selected to participate in the NCAA tournament, the most ever, and a sign of the continuing competitive progress we're making in men's basketball. Two stats that I think are actually among the most remarkable. For the second year in a row, we had every one of our softball teams, all 13 selected to the NCAA tournament, and for the first time, all 14 men's golf teams. That's not something that's likely to happen, yet it's happened, and it's happened with the Southeastern Conference over the last few years. An SEC record 57 teams earned public recognition awards from the NCAA, from the NCAA for achieving academic progress rates in the top 10% of their sport. That's notable because if you went back 10 to 12 years when the APR metric was first launched, nearly that same number of teams were either below or far too close to the margin of being ineligible for NCAA postseason competition. We have made great progress as a league academically over the last decade. Those teams earning public recognition include LSU, who had eight teams honored, Auburn and Kentucky with six teams each, South Carolina and Vanderbilt each with five teams, and four of our member institutions had four teams on that list. Over a year's time, 60,000 hours of community service were contributed by our student athletes in our local communities. 15 student athletes in 10 sports earned either national or co-national athlete of the year honors. We know our continued success is not a given. Our competitors seek our same achievements and the change around us is happening at a more rapid pace, it seems, than ever before. For the SEC to extend our achievements, we will be thoughtful and strategic as we continually assess our tactics. For example, last year we modified how we managed parts of the football game. That reduced the total time of our games by six minutes on average. And we're pleased to see the NCAA Rules Committee taking measures to address the pace of play in football games. We're working now to introduce what we call a TV timeout clock that will be managed by the red hat on the sideline and display the actual length of each TV timeout and show the countdown of time on a field level clock until play resumes. We're the first to announce a conference dedicated channel with Sirius XM, SEC Channel 374, which is vying personally for time with Channel 30, the U2 Experience channel, and I'm clear to say that it's actually losing that competition on my car radio, as good as it is. The SEC continued its leadership position when our membership in Destin voted unanimously to expand the conference's serious misconduct rule to apply to all incoming student athletes establishing clear expectations for young people seeking to participate in intercollegiate athletics 
on an SEC campus, be they incoming freshmen or transfer student athletes. We've also been an initiator of change in the use of video review to support officiating. 2016, we created college level instant replay review in football. This past basketball season for our conference games, we introduced an experiment around centralized replay. We think the experiment worked well and intend to do the same for the coming season. In baseball, we expanded the number of plays subject to video review, and we offered our coaches a challenge opportunity within games. And next year, we plan to implement centralized replay for the 2019 season in baseball. And in volleyball, we'll add a third official in the arena this fall to review replays and make those determinations. The SEC's approach to football scheduling is traditionally a subject that generates a bit of debate and fills plenty of airtime and column space. Following the addition of Texas A&M in Missouri, we shifted to what we call a 6-1-1 model. And that means each team plays six games within its own division, one game against a permanently designated opponent from the other division, and an additional game against an opponent from the other division that rotates on an annual basis. Following a year-long review back in 2014 of quite literally every possible scheduling option available, the 611 model was the clear preference of the SEC's member institutions. Has the SEC's approach worked? Let's just take a look at what's happened around our football. We are the only conference to have at least 10 teams qualify for bowl games for four consecutive seasons which started in 2013 and extended through 2016. And last year, we had nine bowl eligible teams. As a conference, we've led the nation in football attendance for 19 years. The conference's approach maintains our longstanding rivalries, both within divisions and across divisions where they exist. We play conference games beginning typically the second week of the season, sometimes in week one, and those games extend throughout the entire season, giving our fans access to SEC versus SEC competition all season long. In 2016, as an outcome of that 2014 review, the conference mandated each team play a ninth game against an opponent from an Autonomy 5 conference. A team from the SEC has played in 11 of the last 12 national championship games, and five different SEC teams have accessed the national championship game. Four different SEC teams have participated in winning nine of the past 12 national titles. By comparison, no other conference has had more than two institutions access those national championship games during that time. And twice in the past seven years, as I mentioned earlier, we've had an all SEC matchup in the national championship game, which no other conference has done on any occasion in that period. Our success as a league should not be attributed simply to our scheduling philosophy. But year after year, our best teams have produced the best team in the country. The facts candidly speak for themselves. Stated succinctly, what we do works at both a national championship level and at a level that provides our teams meaningful access to postseason bowl opportunities. Despite our success, every year we engage with our athletics directors in a thorough analysis of football issues. We look at scheduling information, we review national, national trends, and we analyze the work of the College Football Playoff Selection Committee. The results of our athletics directors' review are shared with our presidents and chancellors and discussed with that group. I do not presently anticipate any major change in our approach, but I do anticipate healthy and continued dialogue both now and the future among our leadership. Again, we have a history of being thoughtful and strategic as we decide major policy issues, and I assure you the same approach will continue. One place where change is occurring and occurring rapidly is around the media. Probably no group needs to hear that from me any less than you. 
The evolving landscape includes mergers, proposed mergers, new network leaders, emerging technology shifts in consumer behavior, all of which are helping to redefine the present and the future of television. Through the current upheaval, the SEC continues to build upon its strong media presence. For example, SEC teams played in the five most highly rated college football games last year, and as, re as I recall across the continuum, 13 of the top 25 rated games. The CFP championship game showed a year-over-year -year -year increase in viewership when the two SEC teams were involved. Our conference championship game continues to be the most viewed of any conference championship game. And during the 2017 season, for the ninth year in a row, the SEC on CBS package was the highest rated college football package. 1,432 days ago, if you're keeping exact totals, we began a new partnership with ESPN, what is recognized as the most successful launch of a cable network in television history. Despite being the newest of the conference networks, awareness of the SEC network is currently high, and thanks to our partners at ESPN, this reach has been extended. This fall, the SEC network will be available on, on Altice's New York Metropolitan Area Cable TV service, meaning the SEC network is on every major cable and satellite provider in the country. We are also on every over-the-top provider, the only conference channel to have that distribution on the new direct-to-consumer providers. Internationally, the SEC network is available in 130 countries. This is an incredibly successful endeavor, and we expect to remain the leading conference network and have no interest in being similar or comparable. We want to stand unique among our peers. Part of our success is due to the people and personalities involved on the SEC network. We, along with Phyllis, Tammy, Daryl, Bobby, Iman, Jim, and numerous others, were pleased to see afternoons on the SEC network will remain interesting and compelling as ESPN and Paul Feinbaum recently agreed to a new contract for Paul's work with ESPN and on the SEC network. I'm certain I left someone off that list and they'll call and let Paul know shortly. I'm grateful to have had e new ESPN President Jimmy Pitaro join us in Destin for our annual meetings. Jimmy's schedule is incredibly busy, and his willingness to travel and engage in meaningful dialogue with our presidents, our chancellors, and our athletics directors about his vision for ESPN and its work with the SEC is both appreciated and important. The SEC on CBS, the SEC Network and ESPN's presentation of the Southeastern Conference represent important relationships for us. We know we bring great value to the media marketplace. We look forward to innovating and to adapting with a focus on providing the best possible access to our fans through our media agreements and increasing the support that's provided to our universities and to our athletic programs. The world around us is continually changing, and the game of football is continuing its evolution. Later this week, you will hear from Steve Shaw on additional rule changes and points of emphasis around the game. One of the areas of change for us is the Supreme Court decision in Murphy versus the NCAA. As we expect to see, in fact, are seeing the expanded presence of legalized sports gambling across the country. Understand that since 2011, members of the SEC staff have been in communication with and learning with those who work in legalized sports gambling. We've also been in contact over the last year with representatives from the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and the PGA offices to monitor and learn from their efforts and to stay up to date on their legislative conversations. Gambling activity around sports is not new, and that includes gambling activity around collegiate sports. What is new is the expansion of legalized sports gambling and the increased cultural acceptance of legalized sports gambling. For us, 
the integrity of our games is of the utmost importance. While it may be preferred to have no expansion of gambling activity, what is needed now is for our state and federal legislative leaders to enact policies that properly support the integrity of our games and provide the necessary protections for our students and our student athletes. In Destin, we briefly discussed the concept of injury reporting with our football coaches and athletics directors. It's clear that the nature of any so-called injury report around college sports will have very different dynamics than are present at the professional level. FERPA and HIPAA requirements, academic suspensions, other team or athletics department imposed suspensions, and NCAA eligibility issues make something more like an availability report relevant for discussion. I do not believe this has to happen before the 2018 season, either on the part of this conference or at a national level. I expect, however, the change in sports gambling could be and will be likely the impetus for the creation of such reports in our future. Identifying the proper approach should be the priority, not haste. And that will result from collaboration among the American Football Coaches Association and its representatives, the conferences, the NCAA national office, learning from the professional leagues and with proper guidance from legal resources. If this is to happen, we have one opportunity to get it right. The importance of integrity in college athletics is underscored by what has transpired in college basketball over the past 12 months. Arrests, indictments, and the eventual appointment of a special commission led by the former United States, United States Secretary of State resulted from an unhealthy culture and unacceptable actions by individuals. I expect we will see in early August the NCAA board adopt most, if not all, of the Rice Commission recommendations. Of even greater importance, than enacting recommendations is for those of us associated with intercollegiate athletics, commissioners, presidents, chancellors, athletics directors, coaches, staff members, boosters, and student athletes to all conduct ourselves with a level of integrity that properly resents the ideals and values of higher education. To that point, yesterday, former LSU basketball coach Dale Brown sent me an email. I don't know if you know, but he's prolific with his emails. And it was a quote from John Wood, and it said this, quote, no written word, no spoken plea can teach our students what they should be, nor all the books on the shelves. It is what the teachers are themselves, end of quote. That's a pretty good and timely reminder regarding our own expectations for ourselves. Now, understand this is important because I believe, despite the winds of change and problematic stories that arise from time, the time in the SEC and all across intercollegiate athletics, we do important work and we do it incredibly well. This week, you'll meet people like Ross Piercebacher from Alabama, Josiah Coatney and Sean Rawlings from Old Miss, and Nick Fitzgerald from Mississippi State, all of whom have already earned their bachelor's degrees. Eli Wolf from Tennessee, who declined other Division I scholarship offers to join his brother as a non-scholarship student athlete on the Tennessee Volunteers football team. Arkansas's Yelda Froholt, who is from Svenborg, Denmark, marking the first time an SEC commissioner's remarks have ever included Svenborg, Denmark in them. Missouri's Drew Locke, who not only is one of the most highly rated quarterbacks in the country, but a third generation member of the Mizzou football team. LSU's Devin White Jr., who owns seven horses, and on Sunday, the team's day off winds down by riding one of those horses on a regular basis. Vanderbilt's Ladarius Wiley, who spent May studying abroad in Australia, and George's J.R. Reed, who has a sister who's a member of the Texas A&M track and field team. I'm not gonna name all 42 because these are just some of the young men you'll meet this week who represent what is done well in college football. But doing well is not limited to football in the Southeastern Conference. In fact, as I conclude today, 
I'll do so by honoring a young woman who made a profound impact during her short time as an SEC student athlete, honoring a group of student athletes who supported her, and honoring a young man who demonstrated leadership on the football field. The young woman is Alex Wilcox, a member of the softball team at Mississippi State whom we lost after her courageous battle with ovarian cancer. Every one of the SEC softball teams rallied around Alex and the No One Fights Alone campaign. I want you to understand this wasn't the result of something my office did, or a conference meeting, or an administrative idea. On their own to encourage and care for a member of the SEC family, every softball team in the conference displayed its support through, for Alex through videos, wearing teal uniforms, displaying Alex's name on their helmets, pregame gear on bracelets they wore. We're still saddened by Alex's untimely passing. We are encouraged and humbled by the leadership shown by the young women on our softball teams. That is why we honored every one of those teams with the SEC Sportsmanship Award this year. South Carolina Jake Bentley was also a recipient of this year's Sportsmanship Award. You may know the story. In the game in Knoxville between South Carolina and Tennessee, the Gamecocks took a 15-9 lead with 113 left to play. Tennessee's freshman quarterback, Jarrett Garantano, <clears throat> led the Volunteers to first and goal at the two-yard line with nine seconds to play. But three incomplete passes ended the game with the score still at 15-9. to nine. As South Carolina celebrated, Garantano sat dejected on the sideline. It was then that Jake noticed him, jogged toward him, bent down, and offered words of encouragement. A picture, as they say, is worth a thousand words. Thank you to Alex for being part of the SEC. Thank you to the softball teams of this great conference for the support and the encouragement you showed to her. And thank you, Jake, for your friendship, your encouragement, and your leadership. Now, as is our tradition, we'll have some time for questions. And as Tom Petty sang, the wait is the hardest part. <laughs> 